Welcome everybody to what's going to be a very informative, straight to the point, no bullshit review about the Suzuki DRZ400E. In this video, I'm going to review the bike from the angle of a all-round dual sport, so please keep that in mind. And I'm going to give you my top five pros, my top five must-do upgrades, and more importantly, my top five potential issues and problems with this bike, especially if you're going to be a long-term owner like me, or you're looking to buy one secondhand. I'm in the backyard where the bike belongs, the sun is shining, but I've got a fair bit of um, mist to burn off, so hopefully that burns off as I speak and we can actually get some good views, so not just looking at my ugly face talking about the bike. At the end of the video though, because I get this question asked so many times, I am going to do a quick segment on my moto vlogging setup, because I believe I've got a pretty basic no frill setup that gets the job done and works very well. Um, over these louder exhaust type bikes. So if you're only interested in that, please go to the end of the video and skip the review. Otherwise, let's get straight to it. Positive number one, and the biggest positive in my opinion, if you don't want to buy two bikes and or can't afford it, this bike is a true definition of a dual sports bike. You can load up the bike with 50 kilos of luggage and cross the country like Australia and or deserts, the bike will do it. You can strip the bike back or you can even keep it like this, chuck it in the back of the trailer and do an enduro day with your friends, the bike will do it. You can ride at 110 kilometers all day long on a freeway, not that that's fun, but the bike will do it. It's certainly not the best at any of those things, but this bike is a true, true definition of a dual sports bike and the one bike will allow you to ride any sort of terrain and any type of riding you want. So that's a major, major pro in my opinion. Pro number two, reliability. It's a word that will get attached to this bike all the time. And there is a reason why over 23 years since its introduction, it's barely been unchanged. There's a reason why that a lot of the adventure ride fleets use these bikes. It's because it just simply works and it's reliable. I'd be pretty confident saying if you had about 10 different makes, models and brands on a big adventure ride and they started breaking down, if this wasn't the last, it'd be one of the last bikes to break down. And if it did, it is probably super easy to fix. Granted, it's not a catastrophic failure in the engine. So reliability and peace of mind your bike is just going to work is 100% there and backed by 23 years of usage of the bike not being changed. Pro number three, available parts, whether they're aftermarket or original. Whether it's an exhaust pipe, plastic, handlebars, computer screen, it doesn't matter what part it is, because this bike's been around so long, every single wrecker, especially in Australia, has secondhand parts. If you don't like the quality of the secondhand part, you can go to any Suzuki dealership and just buy the original part straight from them. The parts are relatively cheap considering, they're readily available, Wherever you are in the world, you can probably have the part shipped to you. So I think that's a massive win because things will break and things will need upgrading and having accessibility to parts fairly cheap as well is a massive, massive bonus for this bike. Pro number four, durability. Kind of like reliability, but more in a sense the bike can just take an absolute flogging. I've crossed deserts with 40 kilos of luggage, 40 kilos of fuel, nothing broke. I've dropped the bike at 60 kilometers an hour, 20 kilometers an hour, nothing broke. You might bend a subframe here and there, you might you know, bend your little mirrors or your indicators, but the bike in it as a whole can take an absolute flogging. I've dropped this thing of flooded in water, came out, ridden at home, drained the engine oil, it's still running, it's still working. The bike just is built well. Once you get rid of the weak handlebars and put some stronger handlebars on, the bike is simply durable. So when you're on those big rides, you drop your bike, you just want it to be able to work and get you home, this bike will certainly get the job done. Pro number five, service interval changes. Now this is in relation to the bike being able to do a bit of everything. So oil changes, and I've actually written it down here, it comes straight from the owner's manual. Your first oil change is at 1,000 kilometers, that's given. But otherwise, it's saying at every 6,000 kilometers, you can do an oil change. If you're not thrashing the bike, 6,000 kilometers. Now, I can back this up because I've done multiple 5,000 kilometer trips and I've never changed the oil during my trip. I get home, the oil is pretty murky and whatnot, but the bike's just totally fine. There's no, no chunks of metal coming out or any, any debris. So every 6,000 kilometers for oil changes, if you want to do adventure riding, the oil filter after the first one, 18,000 kilometers. I would never leave it that long, but the owner's manual is calling for an 18,000 kilometer oil filter change. And then your first valve clearance check. I've done mine many, many more times before this, but it is saying 24,000 kilometer mark, you can do your first valve change or valve, valve clearance check, should I say. So you could do a whole lap of Australia effectively and not even check the clearances of your valves. And then if you've got the right coolant in it, 48,000 kilometers is what that's saying that it will last. So 
If you ride the bike hard and you thrash it, obviously you'll do it a lot more often. I always do mine a lot more often, but when you're on those big trips, which I have done, you've got the peace of mind knowing the bike specification accordingly can handle the big arm service interval changes. So I think that's a massive, massive pro. Now there's more pros obviously, but they're my top five. So time for my five must-do upgrades to make this bike a pretty well-equipped all-round dual sports. What I'm not gonna include though is the bark busters, the radiator guards, and or the bash plate for one simple reason. If you're buying this bike brand new, you should be able to go to the dealer, mate, I'll buy this bike right away today if you include the adventure kit, which will give you those three items. If they're not gonna say yes, simply just go, oh, I'm gonna go elsewhere and shop and hopefully they'll go, no, no, we'll give it to you. That's what I did, that's what a few friends I know have done. Hopefully that's good advice. Apart from those three things, let's move on to the five arm upgrades. So the number one upgrade for me is suspension. I would recommend anyone who's buying this bike to do all sorts of riding, especially kitted up and loaded up adventure riding, is get the rear spring done and get your front suspension done and make sure the bike is set up for the weight you're gonna carry. I would also recommend is first riding the bike for 500 to 1,000 kilometers so when you get your upgrade, you can actually feel and notice what your money has been put towards. Um, and that's what I did and I 100% felt straight away much better, much more comfortable, much safer as well especially when I've got the load on. And when I don't have the load on, I just undo the preload a little bit and I make sure I get the right sag for my riding. So suspension, must do item in my opinion. Upgrade number two for me, because I am taller as well, but would be handlebars and a set of risers. One thing this bike does come with out of the showroom is atrocious quality handlebars. They're pretty cheap and nasty, and I wouldn't want to be in the middle of nowhere, drop my bike and the handlebars snap off. So for me, peace of mind, and for when I'm standing up, a nice set of high rise fat bars, about an inch high rises, and that would normally get you around two to two and a half inches higher than standard, and that would be just enough so you don't have to go changing or rerouting any of your accelerator or clutch cables, and exactly what I've done on this bike. So that'll be number two for me. Upgrade number three for me is a comfort seat. I've got the Seat Concepts one. This is in the higher model. Most seat brands will make a high and a low version. For me being 6'4", this one does the job. But not only for comfort reasons, because when you're doing the long trips, the standard seat's just gonna absolutely suck. I know guys can use them, but for me it sucks. But it gives you a wider platform and a higher platform to put your, your different types of saddlebags on. So I find that just gets me out of trouble and gives me more options to use. And then when I go enduro riding, I do take this one off and I just chuck the original one on and I've got two seats to use. So a much, much needed upgrade in my opinion for all sorts of riding. Upgrade number four is a good set of case savers. Most bikes have it, but the gear lever on the Suzuki has got a very, very sharp point there. Granted, you should file that down anyway, but my case saver has got massive gouges out of there because I've just dropped it, it just hits. But why would you not just put that $100 part on, probably not even that expensive, and not have your engine ripped open by a simple little gear lever when you fall over. So case savers, both sides are a must do item. Upgrade number five, it might seem very, very minor to some, but if you're like me and you like to keep the bike original and one day want to make it stock standard again, is your indicators, flashes, blinkers, whatever you want to call them, they are absolutely massive times four on your bike and they get caught on absolutely everything, especially when you're doing enduro riding. And I have replaced mine to some cheaper front LED ones and the, um, I think they're called click and ride or the ones that you can pull in and out on the rear because I've broken too many original ones and got sick of spending money on replacing them. So now I've got my original ones at home and one day I'll make this stock standard again and I don't have to worry about always replacing it. Not to mention it's a pain in the ass to rewire, replace, and it just puts you out off the road for a while. So that's my five upgrades there. Obviously there's far more upgrades you can do, but those five will get your bike out of trouble. It'll make it more comfortable for you. And that's the bare minimum you'll need to make the bike an all round dual sports and achieve any terrain without fuss. All right, time for the five issues and or problems. Probably the most useful information for anyone watching this video. I've owned this bike for six years, so I've came across everything, but I've also got three local records that I always use, and those guys have dealt with these bikes for the last 23 years, and they know absolutely every problem that happens because they get the bike in and they can see what's happened. So this information is pretty critical. I believe it's very accurate. So I'm saying that issue number one, or potential issue, is the subframe. As you can see in this picture, it's got this cross brace here, which is purely only designed to really hold a toolkit as, come from, as it comes from the shop. But for me, my one vibrated cracks through it and I made it weaker. So an easy fix of that is a five mil piece of mild steel, bend it to fit with a pair of pliers and in your vise, two holes, two holes on either side of the subframe, 
and just bolted over the top. It makes your rear fender sit a little bit higher, but that has saved me for 20,000 kilometers and nothing further went wrong with my subframe until recently when I flipped my bike on a big hill and I actually bent the whole subframe, but that's a different story. So I've now got a new one, but that mild steel did all my travels, carried all my weight and just kept the subframe in one piece. So that's definitely something to consider. Mount your stuff well, keep an eye on your subframe and if you're seeing signs of cracks or you want to be preventative, just bolt a little bit of a five mil extra bracket and then that'll just reinforce that whole area. Issue and problem number two is potential oil usage. My bike from day one has always used oil when I get around that three or 4,000 kilometer mark without doing a change. If you change the oil like every one, two or 3,000 kilometers, you've probably got no problems. But anecdotally, I've experienced this and I've got two guys that um, are mates that are wreckers and they say the number one reason they get this bike in a shop is a blown engine from no oil because the rider has failed to either check the oil or has gone too long and not worried about doing it at all. So do yourself a favor, if you're going on a big trip of maybe 3,000 more kilometers, get a 600 ml bottle of warm Coke or Sprite, pour boiling water into it, shrink it down to half size, and just carry 300 mils of oil with you because every time I've hit that 3,000 kilometer mark, I've had to top it up and too many times I've been in a corner store or a general store on the outback and they haven't had the right oil or you know I didn't really want to use that oil. So that's what I do to get myself out of trouble. It doesn't mean your bike's got any problems with it, it just means it can utilize a bit of oil, no dramas at all, just be mindful. Issue and potential problem number three is a swing arm. About $350 for a replacement part second hand if you're lucky, around $1,200 more dollars brand new, but the Achilles heel on this bike is you've got this in here, and I'll show you on a close up. You've got this rubber slash nylon high density chainstay or um, protector, whatever you want to call it. It's actually a perishable item that you won't see in your owner's manual. But if you've got a combination of a loose chain and you're bouncing through the full range of your suspension all day, it can wear through it. And what it'll actually do is it'll eat into the actual meat of your swing arm to the point, as you can see in this picture, Mine ate through all the way to the bearings and I had no idea about it other than coming across it by accident. A telltale sign and what I've learned is the top of the chain down here, if that's getting really, really shiny compared to the rest of the chain, you've probably got metal on metal and it's time to have a look. And the best way to have a look is take your wheel, chain and front sprocket off and actually get under there. That part is only around $40 a replace versus $1,200 and that could be a catastrophic failure if you didn't realize and you wore through your whole actual pivot swing arm, you'd be just absolutely screwed. So always keep an eye on the swing arm when you get the chance. Potential issue and problem number four is this little oil return box. I'm not gonna go into explaining what it does. Um, you can research that yourself, but effectively it's just two bits of plastic that are just molded or pressed together. And what can happen, it can actually crack, and I've had it before, and oil just starts slowly dripping down and nothing major, but if you weren't aware of it, that could end up being catastrophic on a big, big trip. So obviously a telltale sign is when you've got oil and grime just dripping down there because obviously the dirt's gonna to attract to the oil. $80, replace the part. It is a pain in the ass to get in and out, but replace the part and you'll have no problems. Another thing that can happen with this is that the oil in there can get really gummy and grimy and actually the oil and the return box is not doing its job and you might find that you lose more oil out of the overflow hose and that's another way you could potentially lose oil. So keep an eye on the oil return box. Potential issue and problem number five might be a minor one to some but to me it can be a major one if you're not keeping an eye on it. And you can see by this picture and I'll get a close up, it's your rear wheel spacers. If you don't pack it full of grease and regularly clean it, they can actually wear a groove where they sit on the bearings because what happens is you get a bit of grime in there and it will just absolutely eat away at the spacer. They're only about a $50 replacement part, but the best way to do it is when you're changing your tire, or changing your tube or servicing your bike, pull them out, clean them up and actually really fill it up with grease so the dirt sticks to the grease, which is a no brainer. But I've seen it so many times that those spaces are nearly about to literally be worn through and break. So imagine riding along and that happens that's not a part you probably think to bring. But if you look after them, they'll actually last a lifetime on the bike, no doubt. But I've experienced it, I've seen the wreckers, they've got plenty and plenty of ones that are just absolutely trash. So keep an eye on your rear wheel spaces and always put fresh grease and clean away the grime when you get the chance to. So they're my top five potential issues and problems. If you're buying a bike secondhand, Look at those particular issues I mentioned because if they have got wear and tear, there's probably a good indicator that the owner hasn't been maintaining the bike, which may present other issues down the track. These things can happen, and if you could be quick enough to notice them and replace them or and or intervene, 
your bike will just ride forever. But hopefully those pointers have been helpful and you get some information there that you can use yourself. So that's my review on the mighty DRZ400D from an owner's perspective and dealing with a fair few motorbike records over the years. Hope that, that information is helpful. You can utilize it when purchasing a second hand one or if you're gonna own the bike for a long time, keep an eye on those items I mentioned. If you're purchasing a new bike, good luck with your upgrades and hopefully they also help. But now I'm gonna go into the moto vlogging setup. So if you wanna stay tuned for that, I'm gonna quickly show you what I use to record, especially my audio, and hopefully that can also be helpful when you get some little pointers for yourself so you don't waste money like I have trialing all the rubbish out there. So let's get to it. So everything I'm gonna mention now, I will put in my um, description section. So you've got a quick access point if you wanna copy or use something similar. This is not for any discount purposes or anything like that. It's just information for someone who's like me who would like to know so you don't have to waste your money like I have over the years. But in terms of filming, I've got a love-hate relationship, but I use a GoPro. And I'm up to the GoPro 9 at this point. I know there are a lot higher ones now, but look, the GoPro for me, it has a lot of issues. It, it always conks out. I have a lot of errors, and I've wanted to just throw it in a dam once upon a time. But it does film and make crystal clear images compared to some other things I have used. So I do use the GoPro. I do use um, just a chin mount here. I used to use a side mount, but I much prefer the chin mount now. And I do have the media mod because the media mod allows me to charge and film at the same time. And it also allows me to attach little microphones and whatnot to the um, actual console when I'm doing this sort of filming like this. So GoPro 9, chin mount, not side mount with a media mod. So in terms of an internal microphone for when I'm actually riding, I just have a, um, a Rode Lavalier Go. It cost me about a hundred bucks back in the day, but this thing's gotten wet, it's been dusty, it's been tortured, and it's been running now for four years for me. Um, obviously all the cables run in and underneath my um, helmet padding, and then the little um, microphone piece just comes out next to my cheek. I do have a dead cat on it to stop all the, um, the wind distortion and whatnot, and then I just sticky tape it down. Now that thing's been there, has never budged for the four um, years I've used it. It's been tortured, but one recommendation is if you're riding, you've got to have your visor down if you want clarity. If you're stationary, it's not too bad, but also if your helmet like mine has got these little holes in it, and put a bit of black um, electrical tape or duct tape over it because that also will distort the um, quality a fair bit when you're doing high speeds. So that's a simple little method that I use. It's worked and you can obviously see by my videos on my channel, the um, clarity is pretty decent considering you're doing 100k an hour with a noisy bike. So in terms of audio when I'm at the campsite um, and I've obviously got my helmet off, I find when I was going to the GoPro, like it does have good audio, but if I turn the GoPro backwards, frontwards, it just seems to jump between microphones and it's not picking up clarity for me and I just find it was just too much up and down and I didn't want to have to fiddle around with all the buttons all the time. So I just got myself one of these little Saramonic smart mics, I think like 30 or $40. You plug it in and it just gives you that more clear, consistent audio, which um, I never used to care about, but I can see the improvements in my own videos as I've been um, sort of learning myself. So this for how much money it costs is so much better than relying on all the buttons on the GoPro and or changing audio quality. So that's pretty handy and it's so small as well. And a real game changer for me is going to a wireless microphone for situations like this. So I have used or sort of so I have borrowed off a friend a Rode wireless go, but to me it was a bit chunky and um, it wasn't very, it wasn't lasting very long in its batteries. So I tried a different brand. I'm now using a, um, a Saramonic Blink 500. So this just allows me, like this whole video I've filmed using this little thing, I just, to me it blows my mind, but I can just clip it here I've got the actual receiver attached to the GoPro um, that I'm looking at now, and I can just film this whole thing for hours and hours and hours if need be. Um, and the biggest thing is when you're riding on adventure rides, you need to have things that last you know, in terms of batteries and whatnot. So this little transmitter will last around six to eight hours for me, but the actual receiver will last over a half a day. So I can just charge this daily. The receiver I can charge once every two days, and it charges nice and quickly up there, and then you've got good clarity in terms of your audio going forward. It's obviously small and compact, you just clip it on. But I can now get to a campsite, I can now go and walk over into the bush, have the camera facing me, and just bring a bit of a better sort of viewing experience um, to the people who are watching my videos. Obviously, I'm learning as I go as well, but I can 100% recommend getting a little wireless microphone, probably basic for some, but um, that's definitely, definitely a good purchase. Alongside, at the very least, a decent lavalier in your, um, in your helmet and you'll have all the clarity that you need rather than relying on just the GoPro itself. So that's my video guys. I've done the review on the bike. I've answered some questions about my vlogging setup. Hopefully it's been helpful and useful information. Um, 
This YouTube stuff's actually been pretty enjoyable for me. It gives me something to do. So please subscribe, like, and comment. I always try to answer as much as I can. But until next time, I'll catch you later.